Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema, Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema, Tu sei l'Alfa, Tu sei l'Omega, tu sei la sola ragione del vivere, tu la realtà verso cui tendere. Tu sei l'alfa, tu sei l'omega, tu sei la sola ragione del vivere, tu la realtà verso cui tendere. Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Tu nutri tutto nel tuo creato, non v'è filo d'erba che tu non muova, non v'è universo che tu non sostenga. Tu nutri tutti nel tuo creato, non v'è filo d'erba che tu non muova, non v'è universo che tu non sostenga. Supremo Santo, tu Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Tu sei la causa di ogni vita, tu sei il movente di ogni cosa, tu sei l'effetto senza difetto, tu sei la causa di ogni vita, tu sei il movente di ogni cosa, tu sei l'effetto senza difetto. Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Per tuo volere sorse la natura, per tuo volere si sviluppò l'intelligenza, per tuo volere tutto si individualizzò. Per tuo volere sorse la natura, per tuo volere si sviluppò l'intelligenza, per tuo volere tutto si individualizzò. Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Vennero poi le tre qualità dell'essere, l'armonia creatrice, l'energia sostenitrice, con l'inerzia che tutto deteriora e distrugge. Vennero poi le tre qualità dell'essere, l'armonia creatrice, l'energia sostenitrice, con l'inerzia che tutto deteriora e distrugge Supremo Santo Supremo Padre Suprema Purezza Beatitudine Suprema Entro poi in ballo il gioco degli elementi l'etere, l'aria e il fuoco l'acqua e la terra che fornirono la matrice per fare ogni cosa. Entro poi in ballo il gioco degli elementi, l'etere, l'aria, il fuoco, l'acqua e la terra, che forniscono la matrice per fare ogni cosa. Supremo Santo, 
Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Attraverso l'interazione degli elementi, con il variare nella loro proporzione, sviluppassi ogni differenza nella creazione. Attraverso l'interazione degli elementi, con il variare nella loro proporzione, sviluppasti ogni differenza nella creazione. Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Vennero poi le creature con varie costituzioni, Vata, Pitta e Caffa in varie proporzioni, i doscia che generano tante differenziazioni. Vennero poi le creature con varie costituzioni, Vata pitta e caffa in varie proporzioni, i doscia che generano tante differenziazioni. Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Il tuo gioco è unico e insondabile, il tuo mistero è per noi inafferrabile, il tuo amore è un oceano senza confini. Il tuo gioco è unico e insondabile, il tuo mistero è per noi inafferrabile, il tuo amore è un oceano senza confini. Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Suprema purezza, beatitudine suprema. All'inizio e alla fine di tutto ci sei tu. Sopra, sotto, dietro, avanti, ancora tu. Tu sei dentro e sei pure fuori. All'inizio e alla fine di tutto ci sei tu, sopra, sotto, dietro, avanti, ancora tu, tu sei dentro e sei pure fuori, Supremo Santo, Supremo Padre, Suprema Purezza, Beatitudine Suprema. Supreme Saint, Supreme Father, Purity, Supreme Bliss. You are the Alpha, you are the Omega. You are the only reason for living, the reality towards which one aspires. You are the cause of every life. You are the driving force of all things. You are the effect without defect. You feed all in your creation. There is no blade of grass that you do not move. 
There is no universe that is not supported by you. In your will, nature arose. In your will, the intelligence was developed. In your will, everything was individualized. Then came the three qualities of being. Creative harmony, sustaining energy, and the inertia that degrades and destroys everything. Then the play of the elements came onto the stage. Ether, air, fire, water and earth, which provide the matrix for doing everything. Through the interaction of elements, with a change in their proportion, you develop every difference in creation. Then came the creatures with their unique constitutions, Vata, Pitta and Kapha, in various proportions, the doshas that generate every difference. Your game is unique and unfathomable. Your secret is, for us, too elusive. Your love is a boundless ocean. At the beginning and end of everything, there is you, above, below, back and forth, Again, you. You are within and you are outside. Supreme Son, Supreme Father, Purity, Supreme Bliss. So this is the song we take up this evening for satsang. <coughs> this is a song which I wrote when uh, I became acquainted and went deeply into Ayurveda. I wanted to express through poetry this uh, philosophy these uh, concepts <coughs> so that's why I put all of these into verses so this is a philosophical point of view it's a way to describe the supreme reality the manifestation <coughs> the creation of how it comes into being according to this philosophical point of view. Of course, as uh, I say often, there are so many philosophical systems and so many philosophical point of view by which they try to explain <coughs> all this play of creation and manifestation, all this reality. Reality in which we live in, about which we are conscious, aware of this physical reality, and also the reality beyond this, from which this uh, relative reality comes into being. <coughs> so it is understood that there is an absolute reality from which this manifest reality comes into being. So this is... Uh, point of view, as I said, there are so many points of view. St. Mark has also got his own point of view, which is uh, not quite the same as this one, but similar. <coughs> for some things, they come together. For some things, they don't come together, and they take different directions. Uh, if you study Ayurveda, you come to know that before becoming a medical system, it's a philosophical system. And it is a system that has drawn concepts from uh, many sources. In India, there are several philosophical systems, just from the Vedas, which are the main ancient scriptures of the Hindus, there came about six <laughs> philosophical systems. And they all have their way of explaining reality 
um, this phenomenon of life. And Ayurveda has taken concepts a bit from all of them, has borrowed concepts a bit from all of them, and through this has made its own system, which uh, it is meant eventually to become a medical system. So the main interest is using these philosophical concepts so as to create a medical system. So the concepts which they take from all these philosophical systems are uh, <coughs> important and useful when eventually it becomes a medical system. So that through these ideas they can apply the medical system for curing, for healing people, for uh, disease and uh, so forth. But there is a main philosophical system from which uh, um, Ayurveda takes the main concepts, which is one of the six ancient Vedic systems, and it's called Sankhya system of philosophy. So as the song says here, <coughs> um, because of your will, was created nature. Because of your will came into play the intelligence. And then everything become, became individualized. So according to Sankhya, um, there is a supreme reality, which they call Purush or Satpurush, which is also what we call in Satmat. Satmat also there is a Satpurush, then there is a Satguru. No, there is a Satpurush, then there is a Satnam, and then there is a Satguru, which are the main concepts of Satmat, about which everything turns, around which everything turns. But in Sankhya, there is this Satpurush, which is the Supreme Being, and then is the male aspect. Then how does this male aspect create this creation, according to this system? By bringing out or creating the female aspect, which is nature that is called Prakriti, or is called Shakti, is the energy, is the female aspect. So, <coughs> by union of Purush and Prakriti, means the male aspect and the female aspect, then comes into being this supreme intelligence, which governs the all of life, which develops from then on. There is a supreme intelligence. Nobody can deny this. Whether you believe in God or you don't believe in God, there is a supreme intelligence that moves the all of universe. All the solar systems, all the galaxies, and all the universe, which don't know where it ends. There are many suppositions, but nobody has really found out up to now where it begins and where it ends. Does it have a beginning? Does it have an end? Yes or not? We don't know as yet. Anyway, <coughs> this all this intelligence is what governs and moves synchronically and in a perfect way the all of life. All these planets they spin around so fast and yet they don't hit with each other. The earth they moves one way around the sun and one day is gone, moves the other way and a year is gone and all the other planets of the solar system that they have their own directions, they are all moved by a certain law, by a certain intelligence. And then the solar system that spins around another solar system in the galaxy and so on and so forth. Everything is moving in such a speed that we can't imagine because we are sitting here and nothing is moving. But this earth is moving to such a speed that you can't imagine. We can't imagine. And also the sun is moving. 
and all the solar system is moving around something else. So there is such a movement in the universe. And what does uh, move all of these? And what does permit all these to happen without chaos? This supreme intelligence, does it? You can call it God. You can call it intelligence. You can call it the way we want. But it's an, in an incredible intelligence, for sure. Then this intelligence becomes individualized. This is a supreme something. Then it takes up ego form, I form. It becomes ahankar, they say in Sanskrit. Individualized I. And that's what we are. We are micro gods. We are uh, macro, micro purush. All the supreme being is manifested in this individualized I in a reduced scale, in a small scale. But it is just the same. Whatever is out there in this supreme reality, it's also inside this uh, individualized person that we are inside of us human beings. So then <coughs> this individualized I acquires qualities or attributes. And according to the Sankhya philosophy, you acquires these three main qualities which we see at work in the all of creation. There is a creative energy, a creative aspect of the reality. Then there is a sustaining aspect of the reality. What is created is kept alive for a certain period. And then there is a destroying aspect of reality. So everything that is created is kept alive for a certain period and then it has to die. So these three aspects of reality in uh, this philosophy, they are called Sattva, Rajas and Tamas. So, <coughs> you know, the Hindus then turn these aspects of reality into gods. Because for the Hindu mentality, everything has to be personalized. All the forces which are at work in the universe, in creation, they have to acquire a human aspect. That's how Hindus are. That's how Hinduism is. So this creative energy becomes Brahma. This sustaining energy becomes Vishnu. And this destroying aspect of reality becomes Shiva. So they become three gods, but they're not three gods. They are just three aspects of reality. You may give a personality to these, uh, to these forces, or you may not. It's up to you. The fact is that they are forces at action in creation. So, <coughs> how this creation then comes into play, this material world, which has these three aspects. But you need something to create this world. You need a matrix. You need elements to create this world. Then there comes, according to this philosophy, into action the five elements by which all the creation is made. And these five elements are uh, either wind or air, <coughs> fire, water, and earth. So these are the elements by which the whole manifested world is made up. First there is the space. 
which contains everything, which moves everything. The space is not just an empty space. What they call akasha or either is not an empty, empty something. It is an incredible power. It is in this space that there is all this energy that moves all the planets, all the solar systems, all the galaxies. Where do they find the energy to keep spinning around? They don't use gasoline, they don't use electricity as we use it. They use a kind of electricity, but doesn't have any wires. That's how some scientists, they propose that we will also reach the point that we can use this energy for our use without cables, without anything. Because as the Earth and everything spins in the universe, so we can also tune in with this energy and use it for our use, for our needs. Which is a free energy, which is there in the cosmos. But we have to come to the point of understanding how to use it. Some scientists like Nikola Tesla went very close to this. He knew how to do it, but they impeded him to do it. And even now, still, they don't, <coughs> even if they know how to do it. But they don't do it because uh, it's, it's not economically favorable. So this Akash or either has got all this incredible power in it that moves the all of creation. This space in which we are is full of incredible energy. We don't perceive it because otherwise we wouldn't be able to live in this body. We would be burnt. But it is there. So the most powerful of these elements, it is this Akasha or this either the space. That's what gives energy to everything. Then there is the air, which moves everything into this space. The air creates movements, so it creates life. And then it creates friction also. So that's how the fire comes into play. And the fire is this power that transmutes everything. Then the fire creates vapor, and that's how the water comes into being. And then the water has got particles which turn into earth. According to the system, that's how creation comes into play. Because there is a space, then the air moving, then the fire, then the water, then the earth. And at the end, the earth will dissolve into the water, the water will be evaporated by the fire, the fire will be extinguished by the wind, and the wind will dissolve into the space. It's a nice way of explaining things. It might be like this, it might not be quite like this, but it's a nice way of explaining things. As I was saying, St. Martin's got his own philosophical system, which is similar but not the same. <coughs> What's important for St. Martin is <coughs> the Sat Purush, or Supreme Reality, Supreme Being. <coughs> then this Sat Nam, which uh, it is the creative power, which you can call or compare with the Akasha. This energy, incredible energy, which is in the space and creates everything. And then, this is called Satna in Santma. And then the, the other aspect which is very important for Santma is Sadguru. A human pole that manifests, makes it concrete, like a plugging factor 
<coughs> in order to tune in with this satnam. It is like in Christianity, if you want. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Same concepts. With some differences. So there is this supreme being, there is this supreme power that creates and moves everything, and manifests everything, we are told that this power, this non power, which is the divine light, manifests the whole creation from the purely spiritual region, which is Sachkhand, descending down through all the planes of creation, the super casual, the casual, and uh, astral, and then physical. This divine light manifests the whole. But then how to tune in with this divine light, with this divine power, which we also call Sadhguru power. How do we tune in? We need somebody that teaches us how to tune in. That's the great importance of Sadhguru. Sadhguru is the human pole chosen by the Supreme Being to act as an intermediary between him and humans. So at initiation is given this inner contact with this divine light. And if we tune in with the divine light, we dive into it, we follow it, because when you, let's say, when you dive into it, you follow it by any means, whether you want it or not, so it's like a river that takes you back to the ocean. And you go back to the Satpurush, or the divine source of everything. So, <coughs> this song <coughs> says, all these things which I talked about, says, you are the Alpha, you are the Omega, you are the only reason for living. The reality towards which we aspire. You are the cause of every life. You are the driving force of all things. You are the effect without defect. You feed all your creation. There is no blade of grass that you do not move. There is no universe that is not supported by you. In your will, nature arose. In your will, the intelligence was developed. In your will, everything was individualized. Then came the three qualities of being, creative harmony, sustaining energy, and the inertia that degrades and destroys everything. Then the play of the elements came into stage, either air, fire, water, and earth, which provides the matrix for doing everything. Through the interaction of elements, with the change in their proportion, you develop every difference in creation. So that creates all these differences that we see in this creation. It is just the different proportion of the elements. What makes human beings different one from the other? It is just the different proportion of the elements which we have in us. In us. So this then moves towards, let's say, the main concepts of Ayurveda. So according to Ayurveda, it is by the different proportion of these elements that the several human constitutions are made. So those constitutions in which there is a ma major um, proportion of either and earth they are called vata, or vayu, which means air. Those in which there is a major proportion of uh, fire, or air and fire, then they're called 
pita, which means fire. And those in which there is a major proportion of water and earth, they are called kapha, which is the combination of earth and water. So these different constitutions have different attitudes, different liking and disliking, different habits, different inclinations and if you develop that Ayurvedic point of view then uh, by looking at the people then you can understand why a person I mean what a person is if it is Vata, Pita or Kapha and uh, all these have characteristics of their own and if you know them very well then you look at a person and uh, you understand a lot about the person That's how the Ayurvedic doctors um, find problems with the people, physical and psychological, by looking at their uh, constitution, how they're made. So we also have then inclinations towards foods of a certain kind, rather than uh, some other kind. But the people like certain things. The people like some other things, and Kafa people like some others again. So it's a medical system that gives some knowledge about uh, how to how to live a better life, how to know one's selves, our needs according to our constitution, and how we should live so that to live a healthy life. What we should cultivate and what we should give up, what we should eat and what we shouldn't eat, what's good for us and what's not good for us. So this knowledge with some discipline then allows us to live a better healthy life. And he said, then came all the creatures with their qualities, this Bata, Pita, Kapha, in several proportions. So it's a way of looking at life. Once there was an Ayurvedic doctor giving a lecture which I was translating, and uh, there was a there was a an allopathic doctor and he said but it, this this system is just uh, it's just fantasy it's not real it's not scientific he said well it's a way of looking at things it might be not scientific but it's a way of looking at reality so you're ready are you for some aspects it is scientific, for some others it is not scientific at all. It is just intuitive. So at the end of this it says, your play is unique and unfathomable. Your secret is for us too elusive. Your love is a boundless ocean. So eventually we may explain reality the way we want, but <coughs> this whole play of the divine, this whole play of creation, manifestation, it's too elusive, really. it's too big for us. We may come to know as much as we want, but as much will be left to be known. It is too big for the human mind. We can never really grasp the whole uh, spectrum, these 360 degrees of this reality. 
You may try to explain it in several ways. But whatever we say, whatever we do, whatever we write about it, it's always nothing in comparison. So many libraries have been written. But of this supreme reality, they say just nothing. There have been theologians writing down so elaborately about this supreme reality in all the religions. But eventually, if these people come to have a real experience of the transcendental reality, then they will throw away their books. Mm -hmm. That's what they will do. There was a Christian theologian, an Italian, called Tom San Tommaso d'Aquino. He was a very great theologian. He wrote incredible, elaborated doctrine about this theology. Eventually, he had a mystical experience. And he said, what I have written in this my opera, in this my big book, is just for nothing. It has no value. Comparing with the transcendental reality, all what the intellect may write about, may say about, it will be just nothing. So your play is unfathomable. We can never grasp it fully. Only when we find ourselves on the other side and we make this journey to such kind then we understand it. But when we come back in this world, what stays with us, again, is nothing in comparison with what it is there. So any mystic, any saints that we call, may say whatever he wants. I myself may say whatever I want. But of this reality, I'm able to say nothing. And nobody's capable of saying anything. And there's a, those who pretend to know, they're just like nobody can know this reality while living in this physical body. Because when you transcend and you go over there, you have the full spectrum. Because in a second, in a split of a second, you may know everything. But this human mind is not capable of holding even 1% of that. It's too much. This mind is not designed for this. So what we say about this reality, even the most enlightened people, is just a tiny, very tiny part of it. The song ends by saying, <coughs> at the beginning and at the end of everything, there is you. Above, below, on the sides, Diagonal, whatever, there is again you. You are within and you are without. So that's, that's what we can say about this supreme reality. That it's just unfathomable. And those who do not recognize this fact, they just want to be blind by their own will. <coughs> it is so big, this reality. You can't deny it. Maybe you can't even, uh, how to say, accept it. But at least you must be open and accept that it is there. I know as much as I know about it. We know as much as we know. But what we know is just nothing in comparison to the old thing. But we have to do our best to acquire this knowledge through our own personal experience. Never be happy with what other people say about it. 
Master Kirpal used to say, and this is a very strong saying, which I never heard from any other guru. You don't ne even believe the words of the Master unless you find out that it is as he says. That means you don't just believe. You try to find out by yourself. Because the way we experience it individually, ourselves, is never the same as anybody else. People like to make general statements. God is the same for everybody. We human beings are the same and, and we, all, we all have the same kind of experiences. No, it's not true at all. I'm sorry. We all have our own peculiar kind of experience. And nobody has the same experience as anybody else. Anybody else which existed 10,000 years ago, that exists now or in the future. Because there are not two human beings that are the same. And there will never be two human beings that are the same. Because that's the beauty of God. It never repeats itself. It's always new and fresh. We like to make everything standard. God is not a standard factor. God is unique, original, creative. He himself, if you want to call him him, or she, <laughs> whatever it is never the same. You believe God is that already made? No. Even God is not already made. Even God keeps creating himself and keeps changing because that's the nature of God. Otherwise he would get fed up himself with himself. That's my realization and that's what I, I know. So that's why, that's why, you know, Sant Mat people, especially Sanji's followers, they understand me as an heretic. Because I don't go with this standard beliefs of Sant Mat. Which for me, they are all meant for a reason. They are doctrinal strategies. All the paths have their own strategies, doctrinal strategies. And Sant Mat has its own. And I don't believe in strategies. I try to crumble down the strategies. That's why I said yesterday or the day before, I don't believe in anything. They made this Anurag Sagar as the holy scriptures of Sant Mat. I'm sorry. The Anurag Sagar, it's a book which is worth nothing. It is just a stupidity. Why it's a stupidity? Because it was written not by Kabir. It was written by followers of Kabir. So many years after Kabir died. And if you see at the end of the Anurag Sagar, it's all a fight between the groups that came about decades or centuries after Kabir left the body. Everybody's condemning the other one. So what does Kabir have to do with this? It was not written by Kabir. So, as I say always, this Anurag Sagar, throw it in the garbage bin. It's nothing important. <laughs> That's it. Don't read it, it's useless. But they made it into the holy text. I'm sorry, I don't know.
what do I say? I would do the same with the Bible. I would do the same with the sutras of the Buddha, with the Bhagavad Gita, and everything. Because it has nothing to do with us. Your experience will be different. I may be killed for what I said this evening. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. <laughs>